Secondly, to First Timothy, chapter number four. First Timothy, chapter number four, and we're going to pick up where we left off. Now, I'm not a real big bumper sticker reader, but I saw one that caught my attention just the other day, and uh, it, it simply read, "I'm on top." And it was on the back of a brand new Jaguar. I've seen this one too, and you probably have. Uh, the man who dies with the most toys wins. Y'all ever seen that? This uh, hurricane that just came through has surfaced a word that I've been keenly sensitive to uh, the whole time. And it's... Uh, you ask people, how you doing? <clears throat> and they say, well, we're surviving. Do you know, neither one of those concepts is biblically based. As a matter of fact, the New Testament, Christianity would reject both of those principles. The one that says, the one with the most toy, that dies with the most toys wins, and I'm a survivalist. Understand something, the word of God says that you and I as children of God are more than conquerors through Christ. And, and the deal is when we stand before the Lord Jesus one of these days, he really doesn't want us to, to be saying, well, we survived. But he wants us to say, you know what? We're a winner and have been since the day Jesus became our Lord and our Savior. You see, when I got saved, when you got saved, the, the blood of Jesus Christ washed us clean of all of our sin and the Holy Spirit of God took up residence uh, in us to live his life through us and that makes us more than a survivor. It makes us a conqueror, if you will. So stand with me and let's just read because this is the message that Paul has given to Timothy and he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to live this out. And not only do I want you to live it out, I want you to preach it to the church. Pick it up now in verse number seven. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the power of the Holy Spirit that we have experienced already here today in song and in your word. Father, I pray that now as we dig into that, uh, that teaching for a few minutes, that the truth, the power, and the validity of it could be experienced by everyone here. And God, we just pray that you would liberate us to preach now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I, I just read verses 7 through 10, and I promise you these four verses could really be four hour long sermons. Now I'm not gonna do that today. We're gonna to try to just pack these up for a few minutes for you. But there's enough of the gospel, enough of truth in here that it would take us uh, at least about eight weeks uh, to get through this. And uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, uh, God has designed your life to be victorious. God has designed your life to be complete. God has designed your life to be a conqueror. And I want you to live that out in your life. And I want you to teach this uh, to the church that you are pastoring. Now let's look for a few minutes at several things that I believe go along with this. Uh, first of all, it, it, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, there is a life uh, that avoids the redundant. It's a life that avoids the redundant. He begins in verse seven. He says, Timothy, I want you to stay away from old wives' fables and the myths that uh, are being propagated today. Now, let me just quickly add, mamas, he's not talking about stopping telling your kids about the three bears. 
That's not what he's talking about. Gnosticism had taken some old wives' tales and some mythology and had tried to weave it in with the principles of Christianity. And Paul is saying to Timothy, stay away from that. Stay away from that myth. Stay away from that stuff out there that's nothing in the world but a bunch of fables and has no element of truth to it uh, at all. Avoid this uh, inclusion. And so ultimately, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, be careful that you avoid those things that really don't matter. Don't expend your energies and your time. Don't, don't take your talents and just throw it into things that have no eternal significance behind it uh, whatsoever. But stay with the things that have eternal significance, things that's going to last throughout eternity. I just read, interestingly, week before last, um, a little study that was done by the University of Pittsburgh a number of years ago, and it talked about the silly things, none, some not so silly, but the things that uh, we um, spend our energies in before we die over a lifetime. Now, here's what it said. Jay, it said we spend, that the study says we spend six years of our life eating. Now, some of us spend a whole lot more than that, I'm sure, but out of a normal lifespan, six years of it, we spend eating. Uh, over a year of our life is spent looking for things that we have misplaced. <laughs> Honey, have you seen my keys? Anybody in your house have trouble just, what is it about keys that we can't keep up with? Then he said that, that we spend two years, listen to this, this is the dumbest thing. We spend two years on the phone calling people up on the phone and getting busy signals or nobody is at home or we're leaving answers, uh, leaving messages on their voicemail. Two years of our life doing that. Paul says, hey guys, don't spend, consume so much time with energy and doing things that, don't matter. I, I've got a real little phrase that I use in, in my life. When things kind of go uh, upside down, I, I just simply ask the question, what difference is it going to make in eternity? What difference is it going to make? And, and why should we get anxious? And why should we get upset? And why should we expend so much energy into things that really don't matter? So if we're going to live in a life that has any kind of meaning to it, any kind of significance, any kind of abundance to it, Paul says avoid the mundane, avoid the trivial things in life. Don't have any kind of preoccupation with stuff that's not important. Then the second thing that arises out of here is uh, if we're going to be victorious and have that abundant life, it's a life that you have to acquire a life of godliness. Well, watch this in verse seven uh, again as we read. Refuse these profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. You, you, you ought to underline the words exercise yourself. It really translates better train yourself. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful word in the Greek Paul really is choosing probably the strongest word that he could use here in that word exercise and train. It's the word that uh, uh, the Greek athletes would use in getting ready for the Grecian games, to train yourself. Now, there's something else that jumps out at me when I read that. It, it didn't say um, depend on somebody else for your godliness. He said to train yourself for your godliness. In, in other words, uh, you, uh, you can't be dependent on somebody else to get you to be pleasing uh, unto God. We gotta take charge of our own life and the spirituality of our own life. And, and you don't need to be pretending that you're going to have some kind of euphoric experience or a preacher or a seminar that is going to get you to the place that God's gonna be pleased with your life. Paul is saying, train yourself. 
Uh, be responsible yourself. It's your responsibility to become a godly person. Now that begs the question, what is a godly life? And, and I'm glad you brought it up. Let's look for a minute, if we will. First of all, it's a life that includes a good devotional life. A good devotional life. A daily time between you and God. Now, let me, let, let me just stop right here for just a minute because inevitably somebody's going to ask, well, how much time do I need to give? Well, I don't know that, that, that I'd be very interested in, in answering, well, it's 15 minutes or it's 30 minutes or whatever. And, and, and well, should I do it in the morning or should I do it in the evening? That's really not the issue. But by the way, you are kidding yourself if you think that you're going to have a good devotional life if you wait until the evening. God, the Lord Jesus said, could, could you not tarry with me for one hour? So, so you got to determine when is that best time when you have a daily time. The, the Bible says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The, the word says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. You're, you're in trouble. Now listen, you're in trouble. If you're depending on a preacher 30 minutes a week, to enable you to become a godly person. You're in trouble, if you're in serious trouble, if you're depending on a radio broadcast or a CD or a seminar to get you to the point that you're pleasing God in your devotional life. We're to spend time to meditate on the word of God, to memorize the word of God, to study the word of God so that we can apply the principles of the word of God into our everyday life. There is absolutely no shortcut to godliness and you can't have godliness apart from a regular time in your life that you study the word of God. I really hate to think, I shudder to think where my life would be today if I didn't have a time that I stayed in the word of God to hear uh, from God, to, to let God speak uh, into my life. Now, when we're talking about devotional life, yeah, it is the word of God, but it also entails prayer. And I know when I say that, all of a sudden, the reality of the struggle of prayer life emerges in every one of us. Would you agree with me, and you don't have to do it out loud, but would you agree with me, prayer can sometimes be an incredible struggle. To, to concentrate and to keep the focus of attention, uh, to, to stay away from the boredom of prayer time. It, it, it's a real issue. It's a, it's a problem. So, you know, I, I tell my staff, don't you bring me a problem without a solution. Well, let's talk a minute about a solution or a recipe to enable you to have a good prayer life. Uh, so the first ingredient into that recipe is praise, and this is how I start my prayer life. This is how I begin my prayer life. I begin it with praise. And my model is what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus said, when you go into prayer, begin your, your prayer life with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So what did he do? What was he doing at that point? He was praising God and he was using the name of the heavenly father as an instrument or a tool to help him in his prayer life. So God's given us all kinds of help with that when we start talking about the names of the heavenly father. And, and you can just take the names of the heavenly father and use them to praise God in the midst of your prayer life. So let's do that for a minute. He is, first of all, Je the Bible says he is Jehovah Sidkenu, T. Now notice the, the word, I got it on the screen for you. T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. And it means simply, you are my righteousness. And so when you start your prayer life, 
God, you are Jehovah's Sid Canoe. You are my righteousness. And God, I just praise you that one day you exchanged my sin and you gave me your righteousness and your shed blood was applied to my sin. And now then, Father, you look at me through his shed blood and you don't see my sin anymore, but you see righteousness. You are Jehovah Sidkenu. You are Jehovah Mekadesh or Mekadesh. Jehovah Mekadesh. God, you are my sanctifier. And God, not only do you exchange my sin for your righteousness, God, you keep me righteous. And I praise you for that. You're also Jehovah Shammah. You, you are the God who is, you ever just get to praying sometimes and you feel like that your prayers don't get above the ceiling and you're wondering, am I the only one in this room? But the Bible says he is Jehovah Shammah. He is the God who is always present. And God, I know that you are here. I know that you're here because the character of your name, you are Jehovah Shammah. And I welcome you into this time in my daily life. Then he says, you are Jehovah Nisi. You are my banner. And that banner implies ownership. So you say uh, in your prayer line, oh Lord, I just praise you that you are my banner. You are my owner. One day you bought me back off the slave market of sin and you set me free and now I belong to you. I am, the Bible uses this phrase, God, you are my prized possession. Powerful words. You are Jehovah Rohi, R-O-H-I. You are my Shepherd, Lord, I praise you that you protect me and you guard me and you feed me. You are the shepherd of my life. You are the shepherd of my family. You are the shepherd of my church and I worship you. And you're Jehovah, here's the one we really do like. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are my healer. <laughs> whether you're sick or whether you're well, you ought to be able to go to God in the midst of your prayer and lift up your voice unto God and say, you're, I just praise you today, God. You're my healer. But then the favorite of most Christians, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You just heard a song a few minutes ago that oftentimes it takes a mountain, sometimes it takes a valley to get our attention so that God can deal with us. But when God flattens us out on our backs oftentimes from that prostrate position, we can look up to God and say, even now, God, I know that you are my provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Shalom you are the God of peace that you come into my... They just, you just speak the names of God. You just tell him who he is. You just praise him for who he is. And before you know it, 30 minutes has gone by and you're thinking, wow, I got to get up here and get a shower and get out and go to work. And you'll finish the rest of your prayer time in the car. It begins to be fun for you. You move then from praise into the area of thanksgiving. Well, I don't even need a list here for this. I, I just thank him as I go through that prayer time and, and praise him and thank him for who he is and to thank him for all of the things that he's done in my life and to thank him for health and to thank him for my family and to thank him for my church and, and, and just to list and you just praise him and thank him for what he's done in your heart and your life. Thank him for what he's about to do. So you praise him and then you thank him and then about that time, you go to confession. Now, here's where it gets sticky for a lot of us Christians. You, you understand, we want to we wanna, we wanna sin retail, but we want to confess wholesale. Mm -hmm. That confession times, God, I, I, I pray you'll forgive me for those impure thoughts. I pray that you'll forgive me for coveting. I, I pray that you'd forgive me for being harsh. I, I pray that you'd forgive me for the things that I've said, the things that, and just confess your sins before God. And then go to supplication. Supplication, that's, that's my hit list. 
That's my hit list. Uh, beginning in January of this year, I'm going to help you establish a, a hit list. Uh, we, we are uh, in, in, in a way of witnessing and evangelism. Uh, it, it's going to be a powerful tool. Matter of fact, I, I am convinced that we're going to see the greatest harvest of souls uh, coming up starting next year that we've ever seen in the history of this church because we're going to start praying like we've never prayed before. But, but, but you just begin to pray. You know who's on the top of my hit list? I have family members that don't know Jesus. I pray for them all the time. I, 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 I had a little book and I just did away with it. I wanted to start fresh. I wanted to start new. But I had a little blue book that I've had for many, many years. And, and in my prayer journal, I, I had a Sunday uh, that I would pray for specific things on Sunday. I had specific things that I prayed for on Monday. I had specific things that I prayed for on Tuesday and so forth and so on. Now, now I got me a little journal and I'm starting afresh with my prayer list. I'm making me a brand new one. And, 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 and really, uh, I, I want a good hit list. Better than ever before. So you just pray about it different people and different things. And then when you finished your hit list, I D-double dog dare you to try this. Sit back and just shut up and listen. God may have something he wants to say to you. Some of the things he may want to say to you is Hey, back a few minutes ago when you were confessing, you forgot about this one. And so he'll want you to get clean with that. It may be in the midst of listening that God may lay somebody on your heart that you're to pick up the phone and call and encourage or that you're to sit down with a pen and, 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 and a card and write somebody a card. One day this week, I can't tell you, I don't remember what day it was, but one day this week, uh, my phone, I looked and there were three text messages from three different people uh, in a very short period of time during that day. Pastor, I don't know what's going on in your life today, but, but I just wanted to tell you that I love you and I'm praying for you. One of them said, God, uh, said, said, Pastor, you've been so heavy on my heart all day, all day. Yeah, that, that, that's a person that's listening to God. So just listen. Seeking God. It'll be amazing to you what God will speak into you and talk. Let, let me move on real quickly. I, I've still got 30 more minutes of this and probably got five minutes of time. But, but a life of purity. A life of purity. The Bible says set your mind on the things that are above. Do you know that you and I are living in a sewer world? And the fact of the matter is you can't keep some of this stuff off of you. I, I, I know one of the guys that I witnessed to for a number of years and, and, and got to see him saved and just died just recently. And I happen to remember uh, going out to his barn on more than one occasion. And, and he was lost as he could possibly be. And, and, and just the message, if you want to talk to me, you're going to have to come to where I am. And so I'd, I'd get off from work and I would go up there to his house and he'd be down to barn. I'd get down to barn and I'd, I'd, I'd walk through the cow manure and the horse manure and all of the stuff that was in that barn. And, and, and you go, by the, you, you're going to, when you're walking through the sewers of this world, you can't help but get some of that on you. It's, it's going in, in, inevitable there. You can't walk through this nasty, filthy world. Get your soul tarnished. And if you're going to be godly, and if you're going to be pure, then you have to think it, you have to breathe it, and you have to concentrate on the Spirit of God, or you're going to get on it. Now, let, let me give you another one. You ready? Not only a life of purity, but a life of forgiveness. I wonder how many of you are sitting here today and uh, there's somebody in your family that you've been harboring unforgiveness. S -s some friend, somebody you work with and you've been harboring unforgiveness toward that person and you won't let it go. 
<laughs> Do you know that your vertical forgiveness is directly tied to your horizontal forgiveness? And if you don't forgive down here, God says out of glory, he says, I'm not going to forgive you. So if you want to be right with God and you want a life of godliness, you're going to have to learn to forgive down here. Then a life of faith, a life of faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible uh, to please God. God wants me to live. He wants you to live a life of faith. Not just when the pressure is mounting, not just when the mountains and the valleys and the, and, and the seas and all of that stuff get rough in your life, not just when the roof is about to cave in. He wants you to live a life of faith every day of your life. You, you understand, the older I get now, I'm just saying to you, I'm praying greater prayers and I'm seeking God for greater and bigger things in my life than I ever, ever have. I want to please him in these days. And then fellowship. You've got to be a, a life of fellowship. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together uh, as the manner of some is and exhorting one another and even more so when you see the, the day uh, approaching. He's talking a whole lot more than just about a worship experience in an auditorium on Sunday morning. He's talking about having connection and fellowship with other believers. Some of you are not involved in a life group. I, I want you to understand, the Bible it says get hooked up with some other people that you can encourage along the way and that you can be encouraged from. Okay. A life of faith, a life of fellowship is a life that is pleasing unto God. Now watch verse number eight. Bodily exercise profits little. Now, I, I really have, my wife will tell you, I really have tried harder in these uh, last uh, few months than I ever have before. But you, you understand, here... We're talking about an industry in America that's an $80 billion industry. And I think we ought to do a good job of taking care of ourselves physically. But the Bible says that it, it has very little profit because one of these days, this old body of ours is going to lay down like a tent and be fo it's going to wrinkle, it's going to get old, it's going to die, and it's going to be buried. But that which we do spiritually, the spiritual exercise is for eternity. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? Come on. Makes me want to go home and eat biscuits and gravy. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over a few things. Let me, let me get into verse 10. And, and really, what he's saying in verse 10 is attach our hope to the living God. Watch it now with me. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the, say that next word, living God. That's, that's a powerful statement. We've already placed our faith. We've already placed our hope in the living God. Now, now those of you know that I, I, I'm working real hard to help Mark Harris get elected in the ninth district and I'm going to continue to do that. I just believe that he's a godly man and that's what we need in, in, in Washington. But our hope is not in politics. I, I'm grateful for what's going on in the economy of, of America. Our hope is not in the economy of America. Our hope, is, and I'm all about gadgets these days. I know that I'm an old guy, but I'm still all about gadgets. And, and I love the technology and the technological advances. And, and it blows, our hope's not in technology. Our hope, your hope, is in the living God. That's it. Problem is, the way most of us live is that we run down to the store and get us some flashlight batteries because instead of living off the power of the living God, we're still living a flashlight battery experience. Now notice what he says in the latter part of verse 10. Who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now let me help you understand something. 
potentially, Jesus is the savior of all seven billion plus people on planet earth. But in reality, he is the savior of those who repent of their sins and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the word is talking about here. He is the savior of all men to those who believe. So it brings me to this question. Is he your savior? Is he your savior? You, you up there in the balcony. Is he your savior? Does Jesus live his life in you? Can you go back to a time and a place when you turned away from sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life was drastically changed by the power of God? Do you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your savior? If you don't know, you can know. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know. And if you don't know that you're saved, I encourage you today to turn away from sin, place your faith in Jesus and let him be your living Lord. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, thank you for the power of your word today. I, I, I thank you, Lord, that you, you don't intend for us just to survive down here in this life. You intend for us to thrive because we're more than a conqueror through Jesus who lives his life in us. I, I pray for anyone in this room now that has never had that salvation experience. May today be the day that they say yes to you. May today be the day that they turn their life completely over you. May today be the day that you wash them and purge them and cleanse them by your blood and exchange their sin for your righteousness. Get glory in these remaining moments now. In Jesus' name I pray.